Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode in our AMS webinar series. Uh, we got a good show today. My name is Don LaCourse. I'm a senior applications engineer with Mexop Corporation. I'm also joined today by Joe Anand. Joe is Mexop's uh, product manager. And as you can see on the screen, uh, we're going to be talking about everything uh, about machining guitars. And I know we have uh, been looking through the attendees. We've got a lot of guitar makers uh, joining us and appreciate that. And we got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, users, uh, entire segment of our users are dedicated to uh, instrument making. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, basically, uh, if you've been here before, most of you probably have uh, used your chat window for questions. Um, Joe is going to be uh, helping me run uh, the webinar on the back end, so he'll be looking at questions as they come in. And uh, we'll get to those questions either directly or at the end uh, of the presentation. Or if we don't get to them, uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you. Uh, with the answers. And as I just mentioned, the last 10 minutes uh, are for questions and answers. Also, uh, we're recording uh, this webinar as we do every month and we'll be uh, sending the webinar replay link uh, out to you so you can watch it again uh, at a later time. Our agenda today, we're going to be talking about um, guitar body machining and we have a good example uh, of a guitar body, and also um, issues related to the machining guitar necks, and uh, obviously also fretboards, inlays, uh, etc. And I just want to mention here, um, we have uh, a number of users who have submitted content, and I know you're in the audience, everyone, so I, we appreciate uh, all the content you provided uh, to us. And we're also going to be talking about roughing uh, from pre-cut blank shapes because a lot of uh, instrument making, it's not, um, you know, cutting everything from a, you know, 10 by 12 feet piece of wood. I mean, a lot of the stuff is pre already pre-cut, um, pre-ready pre to go just for the, uh, you know, roughing and finishing of the specific component itself. And then, uh, obviously, we're going to be talking about uh, tips and tricks. Uh, that's not necessarily a trick, but tips and suggestions. How about that for uh, productivity? And let's go to our next page. We're going to be talking, uh, we're going to go through this guitar body in pretty much uh, a lot of detail. Um, obviously, we're not going to uh, program it. We've got it all programmed out, but we're going to go through uh, the different operations. And a lot of users uh, are are, don't understand or are concerned about what it is they're, they're supposed to select uh, to machine a particular feature, okay? So we're gonna go through the control geometry in detail and um, obviously uh, looking at the tool paths, uh, et cetera. We're also gonna be looking at uh, guitar necks and um, you know, how to machine them, how to uh, get uh, total coverage of the neck and machining it, and uh, also some other things related uh, to the neck. Also, we're going to be talking about a um, <clears throat> inlay machining and fretboard machining. As you can see here, uh, we've got a number of examples of uh, inlay, pocket inlays, mother of pearl machining uh, for the inserts, and uh, fretboard machining, uh, etc. And I'm just going to, you know, and it's going to mention a couple of different ways that you can uh, go about uh, machining these. I mean, obviously, we're talking about cutting from stock blanks, but uh, there's uh, obviously many different ways that you can set this up uh, and machine uh, your uh, guitar components. And then obviously I want to take a moment to uh, to uh, special thanks to our 
uh, instrument makers. Uh, some of you I know are in the audience right now, so I'm going to just put a shout out to uh, Worth Guitars USA. Appreciate it, Tony. Thank you very much. Uh, Dingwell Guitars and also McCafferty uh, Instruments. Uh, Terry, I know you're in the op in the audience too. Thank you very much uh, for the content. We appreciate it. Hey, Don, I want to jump in here. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Joe. Just wanted to give a shout out to um, uh, all the guitar makers uh, who we've talked to over the years, and then especially Spectre Guitar. Um, uh, actually, I, I know uh, Spectre, uh, Stuart Spectre, very well for the past uh, 20 years. And uh, I actually also play guitar, and I have five of his guitars. Uh, I own five of his guitars, beautiful yeah. guitars, all made with Rhino cams. So uh, just great. It's great to have you all here today. Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and um, hop right into uh, the looking at the, the parts. So let's go to the demo and I'm gonna bring up the first one I'm gonna look at is <clears throat> this one here. Okay, if you're new uh, to- Let's start with the body. Uh, let's start with the body? body. Okay. Yeah. What if I do the body then? Okay, um, this is our part. Uh, it's it's a two-sided uh, flip machining part. So there's three axis uh, operations uh, on the bottom. Uh, there's obviously three axis operations, roughing, roughing and finishing uh, on the top. Uh, we've got uh, two axis operations here, pocketing uh, over here for the neck and for the controls, uh, et cetera, the pickup and everything. So there's our part, and what we're going to do first is just show you the different uh, stock blanks that we have uh, set up in this part. So let's look at, let's turn the part off for a moment. So obviously we have a stock blank that doesn't have uh, it's just a square blank, and uh, obviously doing it this way, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, you know pretty much using up all of that stock, and uh, you might want to use that stock you know for something else. So, you know, of course, you would save it, but this is just one way to do it. Uh, with also with the uh, locating pins diagonally to flip the part from uh, top uh, to bottom, and this is just another way you could do it. If you just want to machine the blanks and, and, and locate the blank, you can use a frame type fixture just to insert your blank, uh, position it, uh, you know, turn on your vacuum board, then you can pop this frame off and you're ready to go. And then also obviously um, just a blank uh, of the guitar body itself. Okay, so let's get these. Let's get these parts turned back on here so we can start talking about the control geometry. So basically on the left, we, we got two setups. We got the setup for the top and a setup uh, for the bottom. So for the top setup, uh, we're starting out with a uh, facing operation. So basically for facing, if we go and look at this from a multiple port layout. The facing operation uses the, uh, there's a contour perimeter curve around the guitar body. This is the exact shape of the guitar. We'll be using this uh, for finishing and also for side two, we're gonna be using this uh, for your profiling to actually uh, you know, complete the machining and separate if you're using a, a square blank it'll uh it'll release the guitar body from the blank that's our last operation uh on side two um let's go ahead to look at some of the pocketing operations can you turn on the toolpath uh yeah, so we yeah. Can see this open. might want to do that so there's our facing and Let's go ahead and do look at, we got a number of pocketing operations that use 
um, flat areas at the bottom of the pockets as the control geometry. Let's turn that back on. And then some more pockets here, different levels of pockets. Another pocket here and here. And obviously the neck pocket there. Now roughing. In this particular case, it looks like my roughing grabbed everything. So I'm just going to ignore that. I just didn't select my perimeter for the roughing operation in this particular uh, uh, operation. But basically, it's roughing out the shape of the outline of the guitar here. You can see uh, we've got, let's turn this off. I'll just show you. Basically, you would use the two, these two contours right here uh, for the uh, roughing operation. So it's just going to rough between these two uh, areas right here. So the roughing the uh, perimeter fillets and also uh, this contoured area here and uh, also around uh, filleting around this edge. So Don, uh, there was a question about uh, how how did we create these uh, boundaries okay. or? Okay, so let's just look at the um, the control boundaries for the top. Basically, what we have here is the way to create these is a number of different ways. Obviously, you're going to use uh, your uh, part geometry, and the, uh, Rhino has a, as a many different curve creation commands. You can create a, a silhouette around the part or a contour around the part uh, to create a curve. And then that curve is either offset outward or offset inward uh, to create a region between the two. So we're using a number of offset curves. Uh, here is the the perimeter curve, and then we're offsetting that outward on this side and and on the inside as well. And there may be areas where you're going to have to tie it off uh, to form a closed loop because you do have to have a closed loop. Uh, if you're going to contain your uh, three axis operations, it has to be closed. So we tie it off on this end and just tie it off uh, on that end. So I guess the message uh, to our listeners is that once you get the uh, model of your 3D model of your guitar body, uh, there is some additional construction you'll have to go through and create these boundaries uh, to contain your machining. So you can do it, do that in a very optimized manner, as Don is showing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, you know, you don't obviously you don't want to machine everything. Uh, if you don't have to machine everything, you don't want to remachine what you've already machined. Um, so the control geometry is going to uh, help you help guide the cutter in, to machine only the areas that are pertinent to that uh, particular operation. Now for finishing. Let's go ahead and see. Uh, looks like my tool pass covered the whole part. And I, I apologize for that. For finishing, basically, we're using the same uh, control boundaries here where we're finishing just the fillet and the fillet on this side, and then the uh, uh, this contour area here. So we got basically facing a number of pocketing a couple of roughing operations and a couple of uh, in a parallel finishing uh, operation. I did do a simulation. Let's see if we can still got that simulation. So there's the top uh, of the guitar body. So let's look at the bottom. Now, if you recall, I talked about the uh, stock blanks. Uh, this is sitting in a square blank that's already been machined. Uh, it's been squared up. It's got locating holes uh, in the corners. And basically, you only use two uh, of the uh, locating pins. You set up the one side. You can have a, a work zero. That work zero uh, can be at the top. Uh, out, you know, upper and outer quadrant of the stock or at the bottom, either way it'll work. Uh, and the thing is about the square 
uh, diagonal pins is that you set this up for the top side and set your machine zero. Then when you're done with that side, all you got to do is flip it over uh, this way and machine the bottom. So let's go ahead and just flip that over. You'll see what I'm talking about. So you just flip that over and then for the bottom, you'll use the same, you don't even have to uh, set the machine zero again. It's the same location. Okay, so let's, Hey, Don, before you jump into that, uh, there was a question on those two locked uh, operations that you have. It might be a good uh, segue into describing the functionality of locking operations. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Um, basically, you see the little lock on the operation. Uh, these are alternate methods of uh, finishing that uh, I use. Let's go ahead and turn this off, unsuppress it. And there is a, one of the finishing operations I used for uh, the top. Uh, it is a uh, parallel finishing operation and then also a second finishing. Let's un unsuppress that. So basically these two finishings, finishings go uh, in opposite directions uh, along, the, uh, along the X and then also along the Y at 90 degrees to get uh, you know, maximum coverage uh, for your surface finish. Uh, the idea of these locked operations is that, uh, you know, like Don mentioned, these could be alternative ways of machining that you want to keep around uh, for later, maybe use or maybe even looking at it and maybe using it later. Uh, but maybe you don't want to post these out. Uh, so if you select uh, post all uh, from the machining job, these locked operations will not be posted out. Uh, or neither would they be simulated. So they're basically there as archived operations uh, that you can open up later on and uh, do whatever you think uh, you want to do with these operations. Pretty uh, pretty nice functionality based on some of your user input. So, Yep, and it's going to come in handy right now because since I messed up my first finishing, I'm going to lock that. <laughs> I'm going to lock that and, and leave these other two uh, turned on. I'm not going to generate them right now, but okay. So that is set up top. Now, uh, because you're using a square blank with uh, diagonal locator pins uh, and the, the guitar body is in the center of the block, basically all you need to do is flip uh, the part over and we're going to go ahead and do that. Flip it over. And let's go ahead and turn this blank off. When uh, Don says uh, flip the part over, he's really not um, physically flipping it. He's not doing a transformation of the part. All he's doing is rotating the view. Uh, and in our CAM system, we can do a setup, uh, which basically reorients the tool axis uh, as if you physically flip the part and machine uh, from the other direction. So it's pretty handy. And this is available only in our uh, pro and uh, uh, pro configurations and also the three plus two add-on module. If you wanted to add that, then you would be able to get the additional setups and the ability to actually do flip machining. Uh, we actually did a webinar on that, I believe two months ago. Yep. And if you're interested, you can talk, you can, you can view that on our uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, Thanks, when I Tom. yeah when I, when I was talking about flipping, I was I was talking about the physical flipping uh, of the stock blank uh, on the table using the uh, locator pins. Yeah, and, that is on the machine. I'm talking here on the CAD system or yep. in Rhino. You're not physically flipping it. Exactly. Uh, you're exactly. just machining it from the other side, but on your machine, you're going to physically flip your stock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a good feature uh, of the pro configuration. If you only had the standard, then you would have to have separate CAD files for the top and for the bottom. And that can introduce a lot of uh, inaccuracies, uh, you know, of using two different part files, uh, et cetera. So for the bottom, um, we're going to, again, do a facing operation uh, for the bottom. And here is our uh, roughing. We really only need to rough uh, on this contoured area 
uh, over here. So we got a roughing operation to get rid of some of that material over there. And then in this, on the bottom part, we're going to use a horizontal finishing operation. Now, what we're doing here in the horizontal finishing is we're containing, uh, we use the perimeter curve. So the entire guitar body uh, is open for machining. But what we're doing is we're limiting the location of the operation in the z-axis. So we're saying uh, we're going to go up, you know, to the very edge and then stop, uh, you know, maybe 10, uh, probably more than 10, probably 10 to 15 thousandths below the top face so that uh, only the uh, contoured areas below the face inside of the perimeter uh, will be machined. So, so you see just by using the outer perimeter and some Z containment, you can get your toolpath coverage in the exact location uh, that you need it to be. So there's our uh, horizontal finishing for the contoured areas. And then uh, our last operation will free the stock from the blank. And that is a uh, two and a half axis uh, profiling operation. And if anybody has any questions about the Qatar body uh, blank uh, machining, um, please type them in the questions uh, box and we'll get right to them. I'm going to move over to uh, the guitar body neck. Uh, and Hang on, uh, Don, I think you should run the simulation there to oh, yeah. show how that looks, yeah, before you do that. And also, there was a question about Z containment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's go ahead and look at Z containment. Okay, well, let's look at the horizontal finishing operation. So what I was referring to basically is that when you got one drive region and it's around the perimeter of the part. So everything inside this perimeter uh, is open to be machined, but we don't want to machine this top face because we, we already machined that uh, already, or it might have been already pre-machined. So what you can do is go into the cut levels tab and you can set uh, constraints on your cut levels. So you see here, I've got the top uh, T checkbox checked. So we're constraining the very top of the toolpath uh, to negative one thousandths, actually just one thousandths below the top face. That means that obviously it's not going to cut the top face. So it's going to cut everything one thousandths below that uh, out to the perimeter uh, of the guitar body. And then we have a uh, bottom B uh, set, uh, which uh, just makes sure that the uh, operation doesn't dip below uh, our lowest uh, billet here. Okay, I hope that answers your question. And again, I, I was talking about the, uh, the profiling. Uh, this operation will... Uh, the last operation that you do will free the uh, uh, the part from the stock blank. Yeah, can you run the simulation now? Yep. Actually, I have it simulated, but we can go ahead and, and, and run it. Also, let's turn the tool pass off. Let's go to the top. And let's go ahead and simulate. Let's go just one at a time since they go pretty fast. So there's the facing, the pocketing, one of the pockets. And here is the second pocket to bring this pocket down deeper. And obviously our pocket there and uh, another pocket there as well. And for the neck, uh, another pocket. So there's our two and a half axis uh, operations for the top side. And then we have, uh, this is our roughing operation. Again, it's not adhering to my control boundary. I'm not sure why. Let's pause that. 
stop that. Go back into that operation. Let's remove that. Select that again. Generate. <clears throat> there we go. So we got roughing just around the uh, the fillets, a little bit of roughing, and uh, over here in the contoured area. Let's go ahead and, and simulate that. So there's our uh, roughing. So let's go ahead and do our horizontal finishing. And looks like I need to go ahead and reselect that as well. <clears throat> Remove that. We'll go ahead and reselect that. Generate it. So what Don's doing is basically containing the horizontal finishing or Z-level finishing between those two curves so he's not going on the outside of the part. Mm -hmm. And it does take a while. So there's our uh, horizontal finishing and I had an uh, option turned on to follow the containment area. Uh, we, I can turn that off so it'll stop at the bottom. I don't want to regenerate it again so since we've got other parts we want to look at. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at the finishing at least in there. Let's go ahead and play that. Okay, so I got a couple of additional uh, finishings here. Uh, so, just to Don, there was, a, there was a question. Uh, are you uh, machining it so it goes all the way down to the bottom of the stock, or are you stopping in the middle? Now, for the um, parallel finishing, let's go ahead, the horizontal finishing, let's go ahead and look at that. We do have a bottom B set, okay? But because of the containment of this outer perimeter, the, the tool cannot go any further than the bottom uh, billet tangent, okay? The tool is not gonna go out even further than that, and it's not gonna go down uh, any further. Let's look at the, the tool path again in that area. Again, it's only going down just slightly below the tangent uh, area. It'll be good if yes. I regenerated that, but uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that uh, for now. So I think uh, there's what a good, Don there's has a good done. View. There's a good view of it right there. Yeah, so what Don's done here is he's taken that curve and offset it out by tool radius. Or, mm -hmm. And so the tool's got enough, just enough space to go to the uh, edge of that body. And then he's also put a containment, Z containment, so it stops at that Z level. Mm -hmm. And then when he flips it over, he's going to come back in with the profiling operation and clean the outsides. Mm -hmm. uh, that works very well. Okay, let's take a look at, um, I'm not going to simulate those two, but well, let's go ahead and simulate them real quick. It won't take but a second. You can turn the toolpath off, Don. Looks like the colors are about the same as that one. Okay, let's just do a pause and two in. <clears throat> yeah, that's another option. If it's a lot of toolpath points, uh, you can always pause and hit uh, simulate to end. <clears throat> then it's not updating the display and it's going all the way to the end of the toolpath and then generating the cut model. Okay, let, while that's doing that, I wanna skip over to a neck because uh, I want to make sure we have time to go through everything. Okay. This one here um, is if you if you are a new user, and I hope we have some new users uh, in the audience. Basically, 
you know, when you when you go to finish uh, the neck, you obviously say, well, I'm just going to select, you know, the neck uh, surface and I'm going to machine it. And I expect that to be totally machined. But what you see in here, and I'll do it right on an angle here, is that the tool doesn't go all the way down. And so users, they wonder, they scratch their heads and they, they call and say, why isn't that going all the way down? So the, the tip here is, is that in almost all of the three axis finishing operations, uh, the tool path is controlled by the, obviously the tip of the tool, uh, but the, the tool is projected down onto the surface that you're machining. And because you're constraining the tool path to the edge of this surface, when the tool rolls over the surface and the center line of the tool axis lines up with this edge, it stops. It's not going to continue on down. There's nothing down here to machine. If it did, it would plunge into your spoil board or it would retract. Or we, wouldn't, we wouldn't let it do that. It would, it would retract upward uh, automatically to your clearance plane. So. But obviously, you don't want to just machine that. You want to obviously machine the whole thing. So what you can do uh, with that, and you'll find that you will do this technique for many, many different applications. Basically, what we're going to do is just put a surface uh, under the part for to allow the tool to uh, drop down onto. We call that a catch surface or catch plane. So we're just going to go up here, it's just a regular surface. The dimensions doesn't, doesn't matter, it just need, makes sure it encompasses the entire part. So we're just going to put a surface down there. Now, that will catch it. Let's go ahead and regenerate it and see what we get. Let's go ahead and... Well, you're still going to get the same thing yep. because you're con containing yep. uh, it to the center line. Yep. So you need yeah. to offset yeah, we need that. To, we need to create our offset curves next. Yeah. You're right. Okay. So here's another uh, interesting aspect of control boundaries. So basically, let's turn this off for now. Basically, uh, not only do you want the tool to get down to this plane, but we also need uh, to control it. How far out when it hits the plane? Uh, do you want a machine? So we, we show that in the guitar body where uh, we had the outer perimeter and then we offset the outer perimeter uh, by the tool uh, radius uh, to contain the tool, uh, you know, outward in the X and Y direction. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create uh, some curves and let's just go to a multi-port layout here. Well, that'll work. We're going to create some curves from objects. And there's a number of different ways you can do that. Uh, you can do use the um, uh, duplicate border, which is a good way. It'll only get, only get the perimeter border. Uh, you can also do a duplicate edge, which will put a curve on each one of the edges. I'm going to do duplicate edge because I want to show you the curve Boolean commands. Uh, in Rhino, that's a new feature they added. So let's go ahead and do duplicate, duplicate edge. And we're just going to window select uh, these. Uh, let's go ahead and window select all of them. Okay, so now we got an edge uh, on each of the uh, edges of the surfaces, and they're already selected. So what I'm going to do now is that you can you can join these now, or you can just project them down. So while they're selected, I'm going to go ahead and project them down onto that plane. <clears throat> We're going to use the curve from curve objects, curve from objects, and then use the project command. We're going to pick our catch plane. So now you see we have curves on the plane that are selected. Okay, so we can go ahead and at this point, we're going to go use the curve boolean command. So curve, we're going to do curve edits, uh, curve edit tools, and we're going to use curve boolean. And what this is going to do is it's going to, it's, it's a good way of uh, merging and trimming uh, curves uh, in a particular area. 
uh, as you might know, if you got a little bit of experience working with uh, trying to create control boundaries, you end up with curves on top of curves or curve segments on top of curves. You may end up with curves not being merged or curves not touching each other. So there's all kinds of things that can cause a problem when you go uh, to using those curves for machining. So with the curve boolean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to select curve boolean and I don't want to isolate it in any areas. I want to isolate it on the outside. So I'm just going to pick, it's asking you to pick the regions that you want to keep. Well, I want to keep the outer region, so I'm just going to pick out here. So you'll see, let's go ahead and pick enter, that it created a curve on the outer boundary. Uh, it, it didn't mess with the inner curves, it just selected the outer boundary as a single curve, and then we're going to go ahead and, and merge that just in case it wasn't merged before. So now what we're going to do in our finishing operation, we're going to change the control boundaries. We'll get rid of those. Do you want to offset that first? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, let's go ahead and offset that. Let's we'll select our curve. So once we get the uh, curve boundaries, uh, he's going to offset it by tool radius or, or a little more than tool radius. So the tool has enough uh, room mm -hmm. uh, to go down to the edge of that surface. So it's important to do the offset. Mm -hmm. So let's set the distance to five. That should be enough. Okay, so you see I got an offset curve. Now, another point to... to to a recommendation for the curve boolean is that it will ensure that you have a single curve, continuous curve. Uh, if you don't, you know, when you go to offset it, you're going to have some weird things going on. You want to have a really nice uh, offset curve. As you can see, uh, the curve turned out, uh, the offset curve turned out very nicely. There's no irregularities in it whatsoever. So we're going to use the offset curve in the operation itself. So actually, the curve boolean will create a single continuous closed curve. It's not going to create an open curve. So that's why it's highly recommended yep. uh, you mm -hmm. use that curve boolean command. Okay, so we picked the outer boundary. Let's go ahead and generate that. Oh, it still didn't go down there for some reason. Let's see why it didn't. Okay, so I have my surfaces selected. Let's remove all those. Sorry about that. Okay, get rid of those. We have our single region. Let's generate that. Okay, so what you see now is that the tool went all the way down to our catch plane and then out to our boundary. We had left a little bit area. You can tighten up that offset to get that exactly at uh, the catch plane. So that's a good, uh, I mean, you're going to, that's a basic understanding of a basic technique that you need to know. Basically, for when you go to machine anything in three axis, um, uh, anything that you select is a containment area. I mean, the, the surfaces themselves are going to be machined uh, as, as long as they're visible. Uh, because the tool paths are projected down onto the surface. Uh, but there's another thing I wanted to show you here too. You see that the tool is coming down to the end and it's dropping. Now, we probably don't machine need to machine this outer edge. Let's just turn that off because this probably extends, the stock probably extends further out. Uh, but, you know, you don't want to drop down the edge. And you may not want to drop down this edge uh, either, because it might, uh, you know, deform this edge that you want a nice clean cut along there. So what you can do there is we're just going to add a couple of extra surfaces. So we're going to do a uh, surface <laughs> extrude straight. Should you select the curve? Yeah, I will. So for direction, I'm just going to go pick two points down here, and I'm just going to drag this over uh, for the top of it. And again, I got to flip this over. 
Okay, so we got one on the top, and we're going to put a couple real quick. We're going to put a couple uh, on the sides. So, Don, can you slow that down so mm -hmm. people can see what you're yep. doing? Yep. So let's go ahead and escape out of that. So what I want to do now is I want to put a surface out this way along this edge. And we down here, we go ahead and do, do both of them at the same time since they both go in the same direction. So we're going to go ahead, and you can pre-select these edges uh, if you want. Okay, so we got those two curves selected. We're going to go to Surface, Extrude, Straight. And um, looks like it dropped the surfaces, curves. And now you see that it's extruding. So we don't want it to go in the Z axis. We want to change the direction. So we're going to select direction from the control prompt. And we're going to tell it the direction by picking two points. So you see now that it goes uh, this way. So we only need this to go over just a little bit. We're just going to do it right there. Uh, and then we're going to do the same thing uh, over here. Direction. Over here like that. Okay. So basically what we did um, in about, you know, 30 to 45 minutes, just, just I mean, seconds, it just take you that long to add a number of uh, catch planes there. So now let's regenerate this. And you'll see, the, obviously, that the toolpath is going to stop on this surface. So it keeps it away from the back stock here on the back. It keeps it from dropping uh, on the sides and uh, uh, messing up this nice sharp edge that you got there, uh, same as on the other side. Is there any questions on this technique? Because this is a very fundamental uh, technique. You're going to use this over and over again when you uh, anytime you do a three-axis uh, toolpath, most cases you will. I mean, you may not use it all the time, but in most cases you will want to use uh, A, an offset curve, and B, some catch surfaces. So you want to have total control of where that tool is going to go uh, when it's projected down onto the part surface. So it projects it down to the part surface as well as your catch surfaces that you're using for containment. Any questions on that? Yeah, I also want to reiterate, these are very important modeling techniques you're going to be using, uh, especially when you want to protect uh, edges, like Don was saying, in that particular area where the in the back of the neck, uh, you want to protect that edge uh, from being uh, machined. Uh, then you want to add some additional surfaces uh, to protect those edges. So uh, it's important to understand the principles here. Okay. I'm going to show another part that's uh, actually uses that technique as well. Let's go over to uh, this part here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was submitted by Terry. Terry, I know you're in the audience. I appreciate the parts. Um, uh, they're very, very good for uh, teaching new users how uh, to machine um, pre-cut blanks. Uh, how to contain those uh, machining tool paths, the only machine uh, the areas that you want to machine. So let's take a look at Terry's part. Uh, and also I have a, uh, I have a picture to show you what that blank looks like. Let me drag this over. Okay, so here's our pre-cut blank. Um, it's got a piece of uh, separate uh, laminated wood on the top and also your stock wood uh, on the bottom. So this will be the full uh, um, neck per se. And I'm going to show you what this part, this is actually a dulcimer. So it's, it's not sticking out past the neck, past the body like a guitar. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Uh, it actually runs the whole length uh, of the instrument. And what uh, we're machining here is what's called the strum hollow. So uh, the user actually holds this uh, instrument on their uh, lap. They're sitting down and holding it on their lap, and they're playing this with two hands, uh, uh, the frets over here and the strumming uh, over here. So what I wanted to show you in the uh, 
machine the machine toolpaths is Terry is using two sets of boundaries here. The one set is highlighted. You'll see that they're they're on the X Y plane, and they're overset with the uh, offset with each other. So you got one on this side, and you got one on this side that overlap uh, in the middle. So let's show that other side, so that it contains uh, the rough. And he's using what's an interesting technique here is he's using finishing uh, as a roughing. So he's using parallel finishing, and he's leaving stock uh, to be machined at, on another operation for the actual uh, finishing. And you also see that he's using these additional surfaces here to push that toolpath up uh, and over uh, this area. Well, you, just, you don't want the toolpath to go continue on in. Uh, this is a laminated stock here that continues all the way down. So it just you know helps keep it. Uh, and goes makes it go up over that area. Let's go ahead and look at. So we've got roughing uh, for each. So side. Don, can you can you show the multiple uh, the stock setting as well as the multiple G level setting in the mm -hmm. barrel? Yep. Finishing. So and this is a good uh, one to look at for that case. You see that we have a level right here, okay, and that's leaving some stock here. For the finishing operation. So let's go ahead and look at this. So for the cut parameters, he's leaving uh, 0.1, 10 thousandths or 100 thousandths, excuse me, of stock remaining uh, on the part. And you also see that he, Harry has added a catch surface here on the end. You see this in red. So the tool, when it, uh, tool path when it's calculated, it'll go cleanly across this edge as if that edge were a parting line and uh, it's going to be mating uh, with another part. So you want that uh, nice clean cut off of there. So let's look at the Z containment. So basically, um, Terry has set a, a bottom Z, the lowest, uh, just at zero. So there's really no containment there. But here he's using the multiple step downs. So if you look at this picture right here uh, in the dialogue, uh, you can set uh, the finishing, you can use it as a roughing, and you can add multiple step downs as if it was a horizontal roughing. So uh, Terry has one level and two levels defined. So you have your main level at the top and then your second level uh, uh, at the bottom. And let's go ahead and look through the, the finishing operations as well. And again, Terry is using the same control uh, boundaries for the finishing, both sides. And then on the front, you'll see that it continues on past the catch plane or catch surface here uh, on the end. And also it keeps it off of this uh, laminated area. And this is what it looks like uh, after the simulation. And I also have a, a better image of that uh, close up completed. Let's go ahead and show you that. So here's what it looks like uh, after it's machined. The tool pass were kept away from the laminated top edge on both areas here. And then also the catch surface on the end, um, you know, allowed you for a nice crisp edge uh, here, cutting edge on the end of the part. And then also, for if you want to see what this looks like being uh, played. So you got you got your fretboard here, and then you got, in this particular one, you got one strum hollow here, uh, and then uh, the end part right here that's mating up. Uh, Terry, excuse me if I don't know all the, all the terminology for the components, but uh, I think the user gets the idea of what we're talking about. Okay. Now, we want to get to inlays while we still have some time. So let's go ahead and we're going to look at this. Just one second. Okay. So for inlays, you... You really don't need a 3D part. Uh, Terry has just used a, a set of curves 
and let's turn this stock off. So he's got the boundaries drawn of the fret uh, neck and the fret board itself. And he's got the inlay locations drawn. And if you look here, he's got some inlays, mother of pearl inlays here. And he's got two sets of curves in here. And you'll notice that, you know, some of them are larger and stick out in areas, uh, you know, than the other curves. So basically what's going on here is he's got uh, a pocketing operation, okay? And then he's got a finishing, I mean, a pre, a remachining operation uh, in the corners. And let's go ahead and uh, let's just regenerate these. Okay, so we get some nice clean edges. So basically he's relieving the pocket. Uh, for the pearl inlay. And you'll see that in other areas up here as well. Now we do have in our uh, profiling operation, we do have a new, a new option now that allows you to add uh, those areas automatically. So I wanna, uh, hey Don, I wanna take a minute here and mm -hmm. uh, and talk to the, talk about the refinishing or the remachining operation that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do have this option called uh, Remachining in two and a half axis where the cutter can, you can use a smaller tool to get into areas where the larger tool uh, couldn't get in. So that's what Don's displaying. Can you open up that uh, parameter dialog, Don? Yep. So, so this is available in the pro version, the pro configuration, if you look at the cut parameters. So you can specify your previous operation and the, and the tool diameter that you use in the previous operation. And then it can come in with either a, a offset, a stock offset or a part offset, pocketing facing or profiling tool pad to clean it up. Uh, that's what uh, Don is showing here. Mm -hmm. And this is called uh, two and a half axis remachining. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the the relief operation for the, for the inlays, for the female portion of the inlays, the, we, have, we do have in our profiling operation in 2021, we have added some functions. Can you open up the parameters? In the advanced uh, cornering options, we have some cornering parameters uh, that, that allow you to do the relief uh, directly without having to model it like you actually modeled here, that Don is showing. Uh, the user has actually modeled it here and uh, taking a lot of paints, but um, we don't need to do that anymore because we can add the cornering directly in our profiling operations. And you have the uh, in internal- uh, Dog bones. Yep. So, yes. so the tool will actually go out a little bit uh, specified by- uh, the distance. Create, so it, create yeah. that automatically for you in the corners. Okay, let's look at the uh, mother of pearl. Uh, Part. I want to show you this part. So here, uh, let's go ahead and, and regenerate this again. Okay, so he's got his uh, mother of pearl stock and he's got that stock uh, mounted on an MDF block. And to get an idea of how Terry did this, let's go ahead and look at, uh, let's see which one, okay. So here you'll see that he's got his mother of pearl stock laying on top of his uh, MDF uh, boards. And he's machining four sets at a time. And then uh, also you'll see that, uh, I don't have a picture of it. I thought I did. Let's go ahead and look at the final part. So here uh, is the final mother of pearl inlay on the fret board. Uh, now, you might, you might say to yourself, well, you know, you, won't you see those extra cuts or pockets or relief areas? Uh, as you can see here, no. Uh, uh, I assume that Terry just filled them in uh, with a little bit of um, material and then did the finishing on, on the hand finishing on the top and it, it looks perfect. I mean, it's beautiful. Looks good, Terry. Okay, we're at five minutes remaining and I'm gonna see if there's something else I wanted to show you real quick. Um, I think we covered, don't we, fretboard? No. Okay, 
Um, you might wonder how, what is the best way or how to cut uh, the fret slots. Um, in this particular case, let's look at and excuse me, we, I, do, I don't know uh, the author of this particular part. So if you're in the audience, uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, but I think we may have made this one ourselves. So basically, you'll see that you got some curved. Let's flick this so we don't. Go ahead and change that to. Oh. <laughs> Okay, you got a number of, let's see if those, those are turned on, a number of, I don't see the actual fret curve, so let's go and look at this one. <clears throat> so I guess it's not, they just did it with some other curves, I'm not sure how they did that. Looks like the curves aren't shown, but regardless, you'll see that the try doing a control alt h it might uh, might be hidden control alt no nope, no nope, it's no. Okay. For some reason they got they got disappeared from this part I'm not sure why but basically all it is is a curve you know drawn uh in a curvature uh let's look at the uh multiple So the curve, it follows the top contour of the fretboard. And then uh, the user is just using an engraving operation. And engraving, you will end up using this operation for many different things. Basically, it forces the tool to follow a curve. Exactly. The, the tip of the tool will follow that curve wherever it goes. Uh, up, down, and in between, that tool will go wherever that curve is. So uh, users use this to their advantage. I mean, if you want precise control over the tool in areas that you may not getting the, ex the exact pattern that you're wanting uh, by using one of the uh, uh, machining operation cut patterns, you can draw the pattern yourself and use an engraving operation. You can drive that tool uh, around that pattern. Uh, exactly. So here um, we have a number of regions that were selected. I'm not sure why, again, they didn't show up in the part. But and in the, the other nice thing is you can do multiple Z levels as well yeah. in the engraving. So, yep, yep. And basically, it's just going to follow that curve uh, that you have established and you can drop it down. You'll see that it's an exact Z projection. This side is straight. It's not uh, angled, you know, like on a uh, offset where you offsetting outward. It's just going to offset it directly in the Z axis. So in this particular case, the user is creating, uh, let's see what they're using, 023 uh, flat end mill. They're driving that end mill along a curve on top of the fretboard, and it's dropping the same toolpath in level. So it's doing the first toolpath, dropping it, doing the second one, and you'll see that in the uh, cut parameters, let's, he's dropping it down uh, 090, 90 thousandths, and then a rough cut, uh, rough depth per cut uh, is about uh, 11 thousandths. Uh, no, let's see, 01. The 09 is the complete depth, uh, 0115 is each of the subsequent uh, cut levels. And then I'm assuming in this part that the frets are then just press mounted into those slots. Um, if uh, if I'm not using the correct terminology, guys, I pre uh, apologize for that. Okay, it looks like we've covered all our parts. Joe, have we got any um, questions that uh, users are asking? Let's go over and see if there's anything else I want to show you real quick. Mm -hmm. Looks like we covered just about uh, everything. Yeah, okay. there's some specific, specific questions that we can handle by email. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I think we're good as far as the demonstration is concerned. So yeah, uh, go ahead, Don. Finish. No, up. I was just going to say that uh, uh, I wanted to 
again, give a, give a shout out to uh, our instrument makers uh, in the audience uh, for allowing us to use and show their work. Um, I hope uh, I hope we have done you proud on how we presented the uh, the information that uh, you have shared with us. And then uh, also uh, any uh, new users in the audience that are in the uh, instrument making craft, um, uh, welcome. And uh, I just want to say I hope this information provided some some insight uh, and some of the techniques. Uh, that you can use to your advantage, uh, you know, in machining uh, your components. Yeah, there were some new users in the audience who had some very uh, basic questions. Uh, some of those obviously we could not have covered in a webinar like this where we're showing you the capabilities of the product and how our users are using it. Uh, if you have anything specific, we do offer training, uh, online training, so you can take advantage of that as well. And also I just want to mention that uh, uh, if you're an, uh, an annual maintenance subscriber, uh, there's additional training materials available uh, to you. Uh, we've got all kinds of tutorials. Uh, we have our, our Cam Jam uh, self-training video archive, uh, which is very popular with uh, new users. Uh, if you uh, don't know how to get access to that and you're uh, active on your AMS subscription, service uh, just drop us an email and we'll send you a link that shows you exactly how uh, to download your cam gem training materials uh, anything else joe yeah we will be making this uh, video available i think you got one more slide there uh, don and uh, as soon as we one more yeah so we will make this available clean it up and we'll Post it on our YouTube channel and only for our AMS customers, obviously. And you'll have access to that uh, through your portal, customer portal. So thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you in about a month's time for okay. our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Y'all stay safe. Have a nice day.